I'm Mike Bouchon, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I first presented at NFD1. I think I was the first presenter at NFD1 where I turned Yvonne Popelniak into a prop, which I did not know who Yvonne, and it turns out turning him into a prop is not really the way to start. So um, we will try to, to do better this time. Um, I've been at Nokia since January. Now I'm gonna do for the delegates here, for those online, you can raise your virtual hands if you'd like. For the delegates here, be honest, how many of you, before you saw me posting LinkedIn stuff, how many of you actually knew that Nokia had data center stuff? Like half, okay, that's actually a higher percentage than most. Um, I almost didn't join Nokia in January. And the reason why, if you were to talk to my wife, Stacy, it would, she would say, because it's Nokia. She didn't actually know that we had data center stuff. And I didn't either until I started interviewing and I started talking to folks. What I wanna do in the first um, nine minutes and 31 seconds here is share a little bit about what I kind of learned through and, and get you on the same level as I am, okay? So when I joined, I didn't know Nokia had uh, data center stuff. I went and talked to Vaj Kampela. Vaj Kampela is like the godfather of, of uh, Nokia's IP business. He'll talk next. Um, and talking to, to Vach, it was pretty clear up front. Um, Nokia has a very, very capable hardware portfolio. Um, I've run multiple businesses before in the data center space. The first thing that I had to come to grips with in those spaces was here's the gaps that I have. Uh, when I joined Nokia, what it turns out is that, that our hardware, we have a complete portfolio. It's based on Broadcom Silicon. So those of you who work in the data center space, uh, you'll be familiar with you know, Tomahawk, Trident, and Jericho. We have Tomahawk, Trident, and Jericho based platforms, a full contingent of what you need. That part was actually easy to verify online. Um, the second piece, so the embedded software. So I've been at multiple companies that have had to uh, reinvent what they're doing on the software side, right? They're, every OS uh, it does not age like fine wine. You get things like code rot, the older it gets, the more you have to refactor. And at some point, as you take an OS in different directions, you have to go through and, and uh, uh, carry it forward into what the next gen platforms are going to be. Um, everyone kind of goes through these, these, these evolution um, efforts. It turns out at different companies, this sometimes works well. Other times doesn't work so well. Um, the, the, the next thing I learned here was that the embedded software as we went to SR Linux. Oh my gosh, uh, most modern operating system on the planet. Uh, lots of assertions during the interview process. If I'm being honest, I have trust issues. So I came in and the first thing I do is to say, you know, is it what it's supposed to be? Uh, the first thing I look at is generally quality. Um, I won't comment on where I've worked in the past. I'll just say that I've had my way around the world on various apology tours for different reasons. When I came here and they said, you know what, the quality is as, as good or better than anyone else in the market. I said, I don't believe you. If you wanna learn if quality is good or bad, the, the, the two people you talk to, you talk to SEs, because they're the ones that have to make sure that things work, and you talk to TAC. I talked to SEs and TAC, turns out the quality stuff, like that is, that is legit. There's numbers around this that uh, other providers have, have put together charts that talk about things like CVEs as a proxy for quality. I think it's an interesting argument to make. Um, somewhat uh, conveniently, they leave Nokia off that because we would be in the lower left of that chart, a couple of uh, orders of magnitude below everyone else. The quality, I'll just make the assertion here, is, is top notch. Um, that part was all reasonably knowable. The third part that I learned, and this part kind of blew my mind if I'm being honest, um, I have spent my entire career in the operations space. I was the, an automation person, if you know the net dev libraries that with the early Puppet and Chef integrations, that was like my team that worked on that stuff uh, with a strong help from actually Jeremy Stretch was the one that told us to go that direction. So another NFD guy. Um, and then Jeremy Schulman gets total credit for doing a lot of that work early on. Um, but I, I started working in the automation space, like I want to say 2007 with some of the Junos and Junos script stuff back in the day. Um, so I have a, a, a bit of pride around northbound interfaces. When we talk about things like, um, you know, NetConf or JSON or, you know, GNMI, gRPC, I've always assumed that other places I've worked were best in the world at northbound interfaces. Uh, when I came to Nokia, the, the, some of the product management team that you'll see later, um, they made the bold assertion that Nokia is best in world at the Northbound Interface stuff. No offense, Bruce Wallace, who's sitting there looking at me. It's not that I didn't believe you. It's simply that I thought you were a liar. And, 
And, and so I, I kind of took the bold assertions and then we went and tested a little bit. Turns out this part was mind blowing, best in world at northbound interfaces. Now that by itself, do I think people buy based on northbound interfaces? Eh, maybe. Like if you're in the cloud space and you've built out like a heavy telemetry infrastructure, like maybe that's a, a primary consideration. But rest of the world, is like the primary thing you, you buy on? Maybe not. But then that leads to the next piece, which is what are you doing with those northbound interfaces? And it turns out we've done some really good work and that's what today is about. Today we're gonna to focus not on the hardware, not on the embedded software. I'll assert that that stuff is not just good, but really the most modern versions of that stuff around. But what we've done is taken that and we've made it particularly well-crafted for a, really a revival on the operations side. So with that, let me then tee up the operations piece. So operations, I think, is an interesting space. Any of us who've worked in the automation space for the last couple of decades, uh, we will tell you two things. We will tell you automation is the future, and we will tell you it's been a disappointing two decades of work trying to evangelize a practice that frankly hasn't taken root in the way that we hoped it would. Um, and so if we're gonna advance the operations story today, what we've got to arrive at is just a couple of hypotheses around um, why has automation not gone as far as we would like it to go, right? Now you could fundamentally believe that there's been 231 tools up until now, and that each of those 231 tools was well executed. It was certainly well intentioned, but for whatever reason, it wasn't the right tool. And the thing that's gonna make a, an automation or an operations breakthrough for our industry, it's the 232nd tool. Like that is actually what we've been waiting for. And in fact, if you are waiting for the 232nd tool, I have good news for you because we released a new tool last week. And so we are in that 232nd spot. However, it could also be that the 231 tools, they missed the mark because somehow they answered the wrong why. They didn't solve the right problem. That there's something more fundamental in our approach towards automation that prevents us from doing better. And if you believe that, then we have to have really an idea on what it is that the actual problem to solve is. Now, for most of my career, I thought the problem to solve was just pure speed, right? What we needed was a bigger engine because we have to automate things. We have to get to um, scripted outcomes that will effectively remove keystrokes and take out fat fingering from the network. And so we've pursued for decades a larger, a faster engine. What I believe now is actually not that it's a faster engine. What I believe now is that if you wanted to go fast today, it turns out the interfaces, the tools, they've existed literally for decades. But the thing that actually prohibits us from moving faster is that networks are fragile. One of the things I frequently ask people is what time of year do you think networks are most stable? So delegates, I know you have microphones, so I'm gonna force you to answer a question. And I'm on a timer, so I can't have you wait for like 45 seconds of awkward silence. What time of year are networks most stable? The, the holidays, Thanksgiving through New Year's. Okay, so, so Scott says the holidays. Why are the holidays the most, you can't talk anymore, so you're cut off. Why are the holidays the most, uh, most quiet time in networking, the safest time? Because nobody touches them. Because nobody touches us, Mr. Andy Laptef. So what we've got is we have a discipline where we've worked, um, we the vendors and we also the, the users, we're complicit in building out a discipline where our stuff works best when everybody goes home and stops touching it. That's a little embarrassing, right? One of the jokes I always use, and apologies to the Nokia people who've heard this before, but for people online, maybe you haven't. I joke that if we built airplanes the way we build networks, I would walk everywhere and I would always be looking up for falling airplanes. What we've got to address is the safety issue, not the, not the speed issue, not the engine issue. And if we want to make networking as safe as the aviation industry, then there's things that we can learn from aviation to do this. Um, we know that aviation, they've got redundant everything, right? There's two, two pilots, there's two engines. We know that um, in the aviation industry, uh, they focus on checklists. Anyone who's boarded a plane when an airplane is being set to take off or set to push back, you'll know they're always checking things. And we know that the aviation industry, they work in those cockpits and those cockpits have hundreds of dials and sensors and whatever. So we got real, real access to fine grained telemetry about how the system's working today. If we apply those basic principles into a network operation space that is fraught with, with peril, right? You're, you know, if you think about automation, right? Does automation make things good? No, it just makes them more. And so if you don't have something that's safe to begin with, automation is the fastest way to break things at scale. What we want to do is we want to drive safety so that we can go and, and, and make those changes and take away some of the, the fragility in networks 
And if the theory is if networks are not fragile, then networks can be fast. Mike, I got a question because this is something that a lot of people ask about. Using your airplane analogy, we don't let airplanes take off if they have mechanical issues. How many times have you seen a network that's in operation that's not running quite right, but because it's capable of working, we push it into production anyway and say, oh, well, we'll sort that out later. And as we all know, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary fix. How do we shift the mindset away from this shouldn't run until it's functional to the point where I'm comfortable with it, as opposed to someone who may not have, you know, capabilities to understand the differences saying, well, we need to push it in production because by the same analogy, that super important business traveler telling the pilots, well, you can take off without an extra landing gear because I need to get somewhere and it's super important. So I think there's, there's two things. I think there's a, a, a process and kind of cultural element that we have to address. And that's really on the users to figure out like what's the right discipline they want to have. On the technical and the tool side, the question is what does good look like? If you could define what good looks like and then you can ensure that good is always in place, then you're in a position that you can always correct things and get them to where you want them to be. When good is nebulous, when it has boundaries that are either ill-formed or, or impossible to, to delineate between which you know good and not good, then I think it's difficult to take action. And then when and you can't take if you can't take action, then you can't get back to known good. The goal for today is going to be to take, take that theory. That's a great question. Take that theory and try to make it real in practice. Um, our goal for the balance of, of, the, of uh, this morning session is to give you a little bit of backdrop on what we're doing and how we're doing it, and then to make sure that we have sufficient hands-on experience with folks so that you can see not just what does it look like in, in, as an idea, or is it the, the concept of a, of a network? Is that the way I've is that is that two? Are we good? Um, so we want to get the concept of a network. What we want to do is actually build out an operations platform.